the mysterious creature known as the Howler. You look at that. Caught on tape. What the f is that? An officer uncovers some surprising cargo. And what is your business back here, boys? And a suspect turns violent. Twenty-seven thousand square miles of the Wild West, spread out across three states. This is the largest Indian reservation in North America, and these are the Navajo cops. Sergeant Clinton Curtis races to the scene of a brutal fight. One man has been badly beaten, and another is on the run. Where do you want him to go across towards Shanta? Took he across the canal. There he goes. Look what he's gone through the uh, canal. The suspect has locked himself in his house. Come on out. Keep your hands out of your pocket. Open the door right there. Keep your hands out of your pocket. You okay? You know what? All I do is defend myself, man. You guys Why are you writing for? Why are you writing for, guys? Because I was defending myself, man. I would defend myself, man. What are you ready for? Because I was defending myself. Looks like they got into a pretty bad fight. We get a lot of types of these calls here in this area. Sergeant Curtis is a former U.S. Marine. He joined the Navajo police after seeing a recruitment ad in the newspaper. A Navajo cop for 15 years, Sergeant Curtis commands a team of five officers in the Navajo Nation's busiest district. Now, Curtis responds to a call to meet an officer on the Defiance Plateau. Right now, we're going on a prisoner relay. We're going to pick up a prisoner coming in from Delcon District. For whatever reason, he was arrested, so we're bringing him in. We got news here. How many you got? The prisoner was involved in a rollover accident. But he took off on the scene, and he was hiding a bus. He was a charity to first aid on him, but he was These guys are Let's go. good people. Get good it. people. I'll help you in. Go. I'm a drunk. I'm a I, I do drugs, I do whatever. In this case, he's being belligerent. Uh, these cops, they don't know It feels like it's going to be a long ride because he's going to be cussing and threatening me. You guys Prisoner relays consume a lot of the Navajo cops' time. We transfer for various reasons. Uh, the Alcon district doesn't have a jail, so all their inmates have to go to Wonder Rock. Window Rock supports the only full-size adult correctional facility in the Navajo Nation. To save costs and gas for each particular district, we'll relay here or even up to Ganado. Officers drive anywhere from 30 to 250 miles just to transport a suspect to jail. It can eat up an entire shift. You know why I got busted today? Let me tell you why I got busted today. My, my, I call her. I, I found her with somebody else. 
if these, these cops didn't show up, I, I would have beat the this, this, I would have killed him. Watch me, watch me break this glass. Watch me break this glass. Watch me break this glass and the cop can kill me. You see it? Go ahead. Did you take a picture of that one? Go ahead. Take a picture of me. Stop take doing that. Oh well. Huh? Oh well. I'm just letting them know. All right, I'll stop it. Do that again, I'm going to restrain you. We're going okay. to tie your head down to the back seat. Go ahead. What happens when we get up? We'll have a tendency to do things without thinking when they're intoxicated or influenced. So, you know, for my safety, I, I heck up. You know, and people don't understand sometimes that, you know, we're just protecting the person themselves. Curtis's no-nonsense warning subdues the suspect. They arrive at the Window Rock Jail without any more trouble. You're my friend now, dude. You know that? You don't want to be my friend? You need some help, man. I'll help him out, man. Look, what's your name, sir? I just told you. What's your name? Herbert. Herbert. You have a middle name? No. Can you? You been here before? Yeah, so many times. Where's the weed at? You said you had weed on you. Oh, it's just joking. The suspect will spend the night in a holding cell. In the morning, he'll see a tribal judge. Seventy miles east of Window Rock. For the past four months, something has been terrorizing the people in this rural community. Locals have reported hearing horrifying screams in the dead of night. When I first heard this, it just went straight like it went, ooh, for a long time. But the second sound, it sounds like a female cry. Many believe that the creature known as the Howler may be the Navajo version of Bigfoot. Others claim it's a skinwalker, a Navajo witch that deals in sickness and death. Six weeks earlier, the Crown Point officers tried to locate the Howler by using the recording of an alleged Bigfoot in an unsuccessful attempt to lure it out of the hills. Official policy requires investigating cases involving the supernatural on the Navajo Nation anytime the public becomes concerned. So today, members of the strategic reaction team will check out a remote canyon. We're still getting these reports of howling, screeching at night. And further back towards the east here, we got a report of uh, footprints. But again, it's still speculation. And our captain and our lieutenant still want us just to check the area, make sure uh, if we find anything, see if we do find anything. We're looking for any kind of signs of a large animal or anything like that. And it goes all the way around back out to the cemetery. Officer Gladys Antone lives at the mouth of the canyon. She and over a dozen others have heard the howler late at night. So when you guys heard it, what did you? What are when, you? The dogs, when the dogs hear it, they come up here. And they run around up here. In the morning hours, you can see them up here running around. The most reliable sources in this area that has been seen or heard, dogs also being chased, and I believe there was an earlier incident where one of the dogs was mauled. In fact, Officer Antone discovered her own dog savagely mauled by an unknown creature. From there, more recently, they heard this howling again two weeks ago. Whatever it is, it's still out here, and that's... Basically, our, our assignment today is to check the area, see if we find any sign of it. Martine divides the officers into three groups. We'll, we'll take the outer one. You guys can right. take this one. It's 
it's right under that shade. It might be a coyote I'm walking right in there. They search the ground for tracks and check out caves in the canyon walls. Let's see, I guess we get up there and we'll check the tracks. By 1 p.m., the teams have made their way to the back of the canyon. Right where you're at, look to the east. Hold on, let me get up on top. Big old rock leaning across. You're not on top. So there's a cave. I think he means that one up there. The officers head towards the cave. Suddenly, they hear a strange noise coming from the valley to the west. Did you hear that how? Did you hear that how? Yeah, I heard it. This is the actual howl recorded by our crew. Something howling back here. Yeah, I heard it too. It's north of us. You hear it again? Really faint. Does it sound like it? Sounds like it. It's coming this way, huh? The officers may finally be closing in on the howler. It was a howling, a definitely a howling, but nothing like I heard before, not like a dog. It didn't sound like, like an elk either. It didn't sound like any other animal that I've heard. Not like a coyote or a wolf. I know I heard it at least three or four times. I'm taking four. The other two teams, I don't know. In Navajo tradition, strange animal smells often accompany skinwalker sightings. If you smell anything, let us know. It came from this direction from where we were at, that last area. I figured it was in this area here, where it sounded like. It didn't sound too far, but we are downwind. Uh, so it could have been a little bit further out too. But as you can see, whatever is running around out here has a lot of, a lot of places to hide. You know, we've been on this for two hours and a half now. Let me see, we covered about two miles. Still no signs of track, but we did hear something. I'm still tracking where, supposedly where the noise came from. No signs of any tracks or anything yet. 500 yards away, Willis Martin and his team have picked their way up into the rocks below the mesa. From where you're at, can you see just above us, those rocks? Yeah, we're looking at it. It looks like it's a cave right below the ridge. From his position, Bryant can clearly see a cave high in the cliffs, directly above Officer Martin. Just judging from here, probably about where these two trees are, right behind it? Yeah, right on top of the ridge. Using the scope of his rifle, like Bryant guides Martin's team towards the cave. You can't really see it from here, you're gonna have to walk up there. As the officers climb through the rocks, they encounter a strange odor. Uh, we can smell that. Uh -huh. And that's just the odor. Or down below, I could barely smell it, but when I first got up here, I could really smell it. It reminded me of as an old billy goat. And if you look at that tree behind you, it is, uh, looks like the bark's almost torn off of that. Then, our camera crew makes a startling discovery. A pair of eyes staring at them from the darkness. And through the scope of his rifle, Bryant thinks he spots something in the cave. Oh, I'm sitting in there. I can see something in there. It's very tall. It is. 
Martine approaches carefully. In here? Yep, right over the top. He tosses a rock into the cave. Then, rifle at the ready, he peers inside. Right there, yep. Nothing yet, there. No? Yeah. You hide three or four people back there. Or alert. But there's nothing back there. There's no signs, no tracks, no scruff marks. And the rocks. If the howler lurked in the cave, it somehow vanished. Martine's team prepares to push further up the valley, but they get an urgent call to return to the station. Just uh, this is a little while ago, the lieutenant called me on my cell phone and told us to get back up to the high school. That uh, they got reports of uh, supposed to be a gang fight at the, at the school, and he wants us to uh, get back over there. Although the officers call off their hunt, they finally have the first solid evidence of the howler. A pair of eyes recorded by our cameras and the howl itself captured by our microphones. I heard it at least four times. So there is something, I'll say that, there is something. One hundred fifty miles northwest. It's fair season for the Navajo Nation. Wake up! The parade is starting! A time when people from across the reservation gather to celebrate centuries old traditions. For a few days each summer, the biggest towns on the reservation host a series of carnivals and rodeos. Outside, I see mustard. For the Navajo cops, it's one of the busiest times of the year. Okay, this question, you would not mind me taking a look in your trunk back there? Don't move, stay where you're at. Okay, and what is your business back here, boys? Get on your knees, get on your knees, get on your knees, get on your knees. On your knees, down. Also discovered three subjects hiding in the back trunk of the sedan here. They were gonna get sneaked into the fairgrounds. Free to copy. I do not want you guys in this back trunk. You guys don't have money. You guys cannot be in there. So I guess there's going to be no fair tonight. These fairs here with the carnival, the rodeos, bring a lot of people to enjoy these events. But with the good people, there's also some criminals that want to, wanted to attend these activities in the dark side where they're wanting to do bad stuff to try and disrupt the community. And we're just here deterring it by our presence. Drop the weapon, please! Police, I need to know your police. police! drop the weapon! Gilbert Yazi is the senior officer in the Navajo Drug and Gang Unit. Continue, continue. Okay, we'll get the guy in the ground. Shot. Just kind of pat him down. Shots fired, everybody Getting knows, coming they're coming in. Let them know we need uh, shot, shots fired, one nail down. As a 15-year veteran of the force, Yazi also leads the SWAT team and serves as one of the department's handgun instructors. Operation location will be Chinle District. Suspect, unknown males, unknown females. Tonight, Yazi and his crew will patrol the Chinle district, backing up their fellow officers at the fairgrounds and keeping an eye out for rival street gangs. We're gonna look into 
the uh, local gang members here in Chin Lee to is all out and about. Try to make some contacts and see who we can find. Where do you live at? Just before 9 p.m., Yazi's unit makes its first arrest of the night. Already clean, dude. These guys are just hanging out here? Yeah, they're all standing right here. We had uh, two arrests right now. Uh, both for public intoxication, being a nuisance to the public right here in front of this convenience store. Suddenly, the officers spot three men yelling at them from across the road. We're going to be checking on uh, three individuals here, yelling and uh, possibly flying their colors and gang colors. We noticed you guys from across, waving your hands, yelling, being loud, uh, flying your colors. So decided to make contact with you, see what was going on. You know, everything about what we do is all for your safety, okay? Oops, you're right. You have an ID on you, man? No. No ID? Today. You left it at home or? Yeah, because this is the res. Where do you think we're going to go? Well, it don't matter if it's the res or not, you carry identification on you, especially when yeah, you turn the age of 18. Today, okay. So you're carrying that rag for, man, with the padlock on it. Just to be safe. Uh huh. Dealing with gangs for the past seven years, we do see increase on gangs, especially like during the fairs. So I say an estimate of 150 to 200 different gangs throughout the reservation, and then 1,500 to 2,000 members. Jan's on back of your head right here. Slinging out here, huh? No. Slinging is slain for selling drugs. He has marijuana. He has several baggies that are pre-packaged uh, that indicates that he is selling drugs. Uh, what are these? Give me the, uh, that's just for, some for some to keep me calm. What's that? Just for some to keep me relaxed. That's it. Something relaxed? Yeah. How much money do you have in here, man? I have a hundred. How long have you been slinging, man? Mm, i never been slain out here. This is my first time out here. How much you sell these for? I don't know. Ten bucks? I don't know. Hey, Lee. We've got a scale here. We're going to place the product here on the silver part here. Right now, it's set for grams. Any more on you, man? We're going to find it. Just let us know right now. We just found the scale on him, which brings up a good suspicion that he is selling marijuana. And then just looking at the prepackaged marijuana definitely indicates that he is selling drugs on the streets. So we're going to continue this investigation further. You running with uh, any street gangs, armed dubs? Set me hey. We uh, talked to two of these individuals, and uh, one of them is actually wanted for an uh, outstanding tribal warrant. They found some white pottered substance in the backpack, so they're going to test it for various type of drugs. Uh, could be methamphetamines or cocaine. Yeah, I, yeah I've had him down. Okay. Somebody at the same place where uh, Delta 70, Delta 10 are. Delta 70, Delta 10 are. Delta 70, Delta 10 are. This is positive for meth. Positive for meth. Something as simple as checking on somebody turn out to be a serious incident just like what we're doing right now. Somebody wanting to get our attention, which they did, and now the person's going to jail getting drugs off the streets. It makes me feel good because we're out there to help the community be safe, and especially with the fair events going on, people can enjoy it better without having to look over their shoulders.
winter is coming to the reservation. So today, Officer Christopher Holgate and his family will be gathering firewood for Holgate's grandmother. I love coming out here and helping my grandma. This is where I grew up in. Hello. Hi. Hi. Because it looks like we have livestock and we have to take care of it. I mean, ever since I was probably about my kid's age, you know, you know, it's, it's home to me. We have our families we have to take care of. We leave them, we leave them behind when we go to work. Because it's one of the most dangerous jobs that you could have is being a police officer. And we always have that mentality before we go to work, before I put on my uniform. And now I'm thinking, okay, yep, um, if anything happens, you know, I'm coming home to my kids. I'm coming home to my family. You know, I'm coming home. I try to set a good example for my kids to show them that they can do anything. A lot of kids nowadays, they don't have that reassurance from their fathers or their mothers. I see a lot of their young kids' generation not even speaking our native language or not even trying to speak our native language. Though some Navajos, like Holgate's grandmother, still live in the open areas of the reservation. In recent years, many families have moved into towns like Window Rock and Fort Defiance. A lot of people like to move back over here. You know, people move from Chinle, uh, northern areas. They like to be somewhere where it's kind of, you know, close and close, pretty much close to everything. So it seems like it's getting bigger. Window Rock is getting a lot bigger. And with the more people moving in, you know, crime rate goes up because some of these people that move over this way, you know, they have a history in other districts. Holgate is called out to a residence where a man is making violent threats. The guy's not wanted at the residence, so I'm gonna remove him. Anything could happen from a small call because some of these calls that we get, we get very little details from them. But you're always playing that what if game. What if he tries to fight? What if he tries to run? And you know, you always got to be pretty much a step ahead when you're going to some of these calls because it can go from just a simple, you know, drunk disturbance into, you know, an all out foot pursuit or a fight in progress or something. 34, we're at 97, number 11, below right. Hello, did you call? Yeah. Uh, where's he at? Is there a room? Is he okay? Or is he just, is he passed out? Police officer, man. Say, come on. It's 34, one right. 37, locked himself in a back bedroom. Come on up, come on up, man. For 37 tried to cut himself with the razor in his wrist. The call is no longer a simple disturbance. It's now a matter of life and death. Tara, for 37 tried to cut himself with the razor in his wrist. Holgate detains the suspect and brings him outside to treat his injuries. I walk this way, man. Walk this way. Oh, walk this way. Hey, calm down, man. Relax. Relax. Come on, son. Come on. Come on. So I walked in, he uh, had a razor in his mouth, and looks like he was trying to slit his wrist. Holgate assesses how badly the man has injured himself in his suicide attempt. Say, hey, Aaron, is that the only thing you did to yourself? Aaron. Yeah. The only thing you did to yourself? So, yeah. No, no much. Don't move, man. Oh. Just relax, man. I'm going to... Clean that up for you, man. Have you ever thought of hurting yourself, like committing suicide or anything like that? Yep, right there, dude. You have? Right there, right there. Look at it. Oh. He's trying to hurt himself, trying to clean up his wounds. Uh, oh. Looks kind of a little bit, not too deep, but. Supply first aid for now, and then, like I said, take him to the jail section. All right, all right, stand up for me. Oh. All right, have a seat for me right there, man. Just have a seat right there. Yeah, the sister and the 
grandmother there, they live here and whatnot, and said that he um, started recently acting like this. Uh, upon searching his room, I'm um, already seeing this laying on the floor when I walked in. I was just hoping he wasn't going to grab for it. Um, already has one of the uh, gang affiliation, Insane, which is you know, Insane Cobra Nation, one of the local gangs here in Windrock in the Fort Defiance area. So it's pretty popular. And uh, came across this right next to his bed. Um, little container. Now, a lot of people carry these. I've been seeing this a lot lately. A um, little mountain marijuana residue in it. So I'll just go ahead and just take it. Uh, anything we come across, any gang, gang or a paraphernalia or anything like that, that we usually um, confiscate and whatnot. It looks like a, a type of weapon, a club they would use, you know, any type of fights that would go on, it seems like would be used for. Holgate transports the suspect to the Window Rock Jail. When's the last time you've been arrested, Aaron? Shit. A, month, uh, a month and a half ago? A month and a half ago? Yeah. Uh, well, you could be arrested for a criminal nuisance, which you can be arrested for. Okay, I can say you can uh, be here. Right now? Yeah, you're gonna be here for eight hours, and then you're gonna, then you get released in the morning. Okay. It's a long time. Yeah. yeah. Is there a right figure put me in solitary? So I asked him if he was, you know, rolling claiming with any gang. Well, he says he's been in the gang for about since he was 13, so about seven years now. So he's been in the gang ever since he was just a little kid. You know, a lot of these younger youth nowadays, they, they, they don't have no father, no role model, you know, there's no guidance nowadays. And they revert to these gangs as their family. So, you know, it's sad to see, I mean, he's 20 years old, I mean, he could do a lot with his life if he wanted to, he could change it. But it's just, it's up to him, you know. Seventy miles south of Window Rock, Navajo Fish and Game Officer Eddie Benali patrols a vast wilderness known as the New Lands. We got some antelope down there. We got some uh, elk down there. Some mule deer. Of course, there are small mammals, coyotes. Today, Benali hunts for elk poachers. Several miles west of the New Mexico border, he finds what looks like a hunting camp. Somebody may be watching his tail on the Hello? Anybody home? Anybody alive? Official wildlife. Hello? Uh, nobody home. Looks like they just set up tent. They got all the gear still out here and a hammer. The camp appears abandoned. But Benali worries that the hunters are watching. They're camouflage, you can't see them. They could be somewhere out here. And it's just like they're watching you or what to see what you do. So we'll definitely probably stop by here again. Okay. Benali heads out on foot to see if he can find the hunters. I uh, just watch where you step. Well, that's some of the critters you find out here. Well, I'm, not, I'm sure he's not too happy we coming out. Moments later, Benali makes a grisly discovery. He was a big one. As you can tell, some of these are deceiving. You know, you get, this is a, a small hoof. Hoofs down here, they tend to grow out a little bit, like a horse does. You know how a horse, they have to be trimmed? This one, uh, and we have the sand right here. And what it does is it, 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 it makes their feet a little wider and people tracking, I think it's a big elk. But this was a young one here, but he's a pretty good size. 
had a pretty good size antler on them. Shot out of season and left to rot, an elk carcass is evidence of one of the ultimate crimes of the backcountry. You know, that's a public resource for the Navajo Nation, and it goes to waste. That's poaching. And somebody could have used it, somebody at least used the hide. If the meat wasn't salvageable, at least the hide could have been. In a region where an elk provides enough meat to last a Navajo family for an entire winter, this waste upsets Benali. Poaching, uh, that's not a seasonal, it's always a year-round deal, and we've had some issues down here in New Lands. Of course, they, they want the biggest antler they can find, and they'll, they'll take an animal for the day the hunt starts, or they'll take an animal at night, and, and any time you shoot an animal, if you don't have the permit, it's poaching. I used to be a narcotics uh, officer, so I did drug work. It's interesting, the mindset of a guy trying to get something for himself is the same as like what a poacher does. It's uh, all about whatever they can get for nothing. Benali knows poachers have been active in the area. Now he pushes deeper into the backcountry of the New Lands, where only a handful of Navajo families live. On the road, he comes across something that would terrify most traditional Navajos. That's a coyote. When a coyote crosses your path, it means taboo. You don't drive on. So if a coyote crosses your path, you got to go back, or you offer some type of prayer, then you continue your way. Probably the most powerful animal on the Navajo Nation but I have seen coyotes make big, several vehicles turn around, go back the other way around. So if an animal can make five or six vehicles go back, I'd say that's a pretty powerful animal. If I do that every day, I'd never get to where I'm going. Unable to locate any poachers, Benali decides to revisit the abandoned hunting camp he found earlier in the day. He prepares for the worst. Two different rifles, that's more or less, if I'm ever caught out somewhere, I need to get back to my truck, this is my backup versus my handgun. And this is what, for, for long distance. She's awesome. But this is very accurate. It's about 300 yards, about the size of a 50 cent piece. This is a Winchester. This is Bertha. Yeah, she's, she's awesome also. As he approaches the camp, Benali encounters a hunter who's also seen the mysterious tent. Are they back? Uh, I didn't see him there when I came out. Benali decides to check it out for himself. Oh. And it's way past dark, so it should have been bad. In a few days, Benali will come back to this area to see if they've returned. All part of a constant battle to fight poaching in the Navajo Nation. Land belongs to the Navajo people. And as far as uh, wildlife, it belongs to the Navajo people. If you're a Navajo, all this belongs to you. And if they're poaching, they're stealing from you. It belongs to the Navajo people. It belongs to us. Seventy-five miles north, Officer Philbert Toddy has just come on duty. Toddy, a former U.S. Marine, followed his older brother, Irwin, into law enforcement. They made you classify me to be the nicer one and him being the more mean one. I always receive a call of a medical assistant, an individual, Reporting that um, he was kicked in the head. I don't know if it's an animal or another person, but he's sustained a large laceration, so we're going to be in route to give him proper medical treatment. It's a little bumpy here. Okay, he's right here. Is that him? Yeah. Is he okay? 
Oh, a horse. Okay, well, they're, they're on their way from Ganado, so they should be here within maybe five, 10 minutes. Already on the scene, Officer Paula Billy removes a temporary bandage from the victim's nasty head injury. Did you black out? Yeah. How long? 10 minutes, okay, anybody here with you? Where's that horse at right now? Okay. How the, why did the horse end up kicking you? We uh -huh. According to the victim, he and his friends were training his horse when the animal turned on him and kicked him in the head. What happened, 30 year old, he was training his horse. Got a little, little squirrely with him. There's a little bit of a laceration and concave portion right here above his forehead, his right eyebrow. He did black out. This guy is in pretty bad shape. An injury like this can be serious or sometimes fatal. So he claims that he was kicked in the head while training this animal. But from what I know, he's not giving us a full story. There's other two individuals that we're seeking out right now. So eventually we'll get to the bottom of this. The officers catch one of the men in the barn. The other has fled the scene. See, another one took off over the fence line. That way. All right, uh, regain your composure. Let's go. Walk. I'm trying to. What's the problem? Got a little too drunk. Oh, OK. There is a problem Sorry. there. All right, start walking this way. So as, as Officer Filbert Toddy takes a suspect back to his unit, Officer Billy makes her way into an abandoned house in search of another suspect. I'm out. You're in here. She finds a stash of beer cans. Alcohol plagues the Navajo Nation, and the law forbids it on the reservation. <laughs> You can't possess it, you can't drink it, you can't transport it. If you're caught, it'll be taken and destroyed. So I see now Officer Billy's on the search for the individual that fled from us. Why he's running, I don't know. So he does pose a risk, a danger to my officer as well as everybody around here. Double police, you're here, come on out. One of the most dangerous things that we encounter out here is when we enter these old structures, we don't know whether we're going to be falling through the floor or having stuff collapse on us. That elevates the danger level for us. The officers can't locate the man and decide to call off the search. Apparently, these guys were training this horse. They've been drinking, and obviously that's a bad combination. The animal got frustrated, it eventually kicked our victim. I can't blame the animal for doing what he did. So I'm gonna be confiscating the liquor and the slingshot that we found. Okay, how much have you had to drink today? About uh, six cans. Six cans? You see out of both eyes? Yeah. is not suitable to be placed in custody because we know he's intoxicated. So we'll just let, him, let the family watch over him tonight. And the best option right now is just go back inside. If you stay here, yes. get some Z's, catch, yes. catch some rest, okay? I know you. All right. Otherwise, Nonsense. take it easy, all right? So otherwise, I'm going to take hey. you to jail. Understand? Yes. Um, Irvin? Close enough. I get frustrated in these type of situations, but in the end, this is what I am swore to do. I uphold an oath to protect my people, no matter what. <laughs>